I'm really sorry to interrupt you when there's obviously so much lively discussion and debate going on. It's great to see. Um, I hope you've all had a, a good lunch and a good discussion over lunch, and there'll be um, op more opportunities to continue the debate later this afternoon. But now we've got our third session on changing wildlife consumption onto a legal and sustainable path. My name's Debbie Hembury. I'm head of the illegal wildlife trade team at DEFRA, and I'm moderating um, this third session. We're going to run it slightly differently because we had, um, there was a last minute dropout for the third of the three speakers. So Rachel and I are going to uh, step in to the gap. Lucky for us, um, we get an opportunity to tell you a little bit about the London 2018 IWT conference that we're just in the early stages of organising. So what we'll do for this session is have two talks um, by guest speakers who I'll introduce in a minute. Um, and then we'll stop for questions and answers on those presentations and then Rachel and I will come up and tell you a little bit about the conference and then we'll open the floor for comments and discussion on that as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dynastia Timoshina, sorry for any mispronunciation, who is Traffic's programme leader on medicinal plants um, and works on sustainable and legal wildlife trade, um, including best practices in sustainability of, and harvesting um, and trade in wild collected plants and engaging companies in the traditional Chinese medicine sector in China, Vietnam, um, India and Europe. And she's going to talk to us about human and conservation benefits through sustainable trade in wild plants. Thank you very much for the introduction. So what I'm going to actually talk to you is, is about wildlife that arguably affects all of us and is relevant to all of us. Um, because there isn't a single person in this room who doesn't consume wild plants on probably on a daily basis. Um, I've actually made it a point of my personal inquiry to try and check whether I would be able to consume wild plants, whether it's a, a cosmetic product, um, a food uh, or medicine um, every day, and it's quite easy to do. So um, the uses of wild plants, and I'm going to refer to them sort of interchangeably as medicinal and aromatic plants, which co covers quite a wide range of species, um, range from food, medicine, cosmetics, and spices. And um, something that's really complicated about this trade is that very often one species that is sourced from the same place would end up in the products used in very, very different sectors in different countries. Um, some of the species, and um, I'm just wondering if you're recognizing some of the pictures even on these slides, um, th but to give you some examples, um, so in one corner you see um, the bulbs of orchids, um, which are called chikanda, so something that's used for food, uh, wild harvested, uh, for example, in East Africa um, or Middle East. Um, another picture in this corner is the baobab fruit and oil that's used both as medicine, as food, as cosmetics. Um, here we have sandalwood, a piece of sandalwood and the oil that's extracted from it. Of course, a lot of issues around threatened species here. And um, in, in, the, in that corner um, is the tree of Prunus africana, the African cherry, that's uh, bark of which is used for very successful medicine um, and it's harvested in Africa. So what do we think about when we think about the conservation um, of wild plants? Um, now, something that's complex about them, and we've heard about the, the multiple species issue, um, is we estimate there is about 60,000 species that are used globally medicinally, which is a vast, you know, huge number to try and deal with sustainability or legality of trade. Um, about 3,000 of these species are traded internationally, and only about one third is commercially cultivated for a number of different reasons, but whether it's a biology of species themselves or demand or um, just um, cultivation be, being unviable economically. Plants are resourced under pressure. This is a general figure for, for plants sort of worldwide. One fifth of plant species may be declining and threatened with extinction in the wild. Now it's a generic figure because we actually have very little idea of what's happening with medicinal and aromatic plants. Most of them are not assessed against the IUCN red list. So a massive gap in our knowledge and understanding conservation priorities. The work that has been done on a sample of medicinal plants shows that the risk is a lot higher, but of course it was, maybe the sample wasn't done sort of accurately. Um, 
it would be a wise thing to think that if, if it's a species with established use medicinally over centuries, the species are probably quite secure because they've been, industry has been relying on it for a long time. But of course, we see a lot of changing demand and changing trade. On the subject of trade, um, so the global value of non-wood forest products, which is another name that's often used to apply to this species, of both animal and plant origin here is estimated around 20.6 billion US dollars. And it's a likely major undervalue because those species are underreported in national statistics or international trade. I'm just throwing these figures into you and I'm not going to talk through them, but just to say that there are various bits of industry that rely heavily on plant ingredients. They include nutritional supplements, organic cosmetics, cosmetics per se, dietary supplement markets that are either growing very fast at the moment or have massive projections in terms of growth because of the market demand, because this is what people want these days. We all want this. And again, something to think about the source countries. So China is the world's largest exporter of what we'd refer to medicinal and aromatic plants. Um, now, these figures are difficult to get by because, as I explained, reporting is complicated. But um, we've estimated there is about 1.3 billion kilograms of medicinal and aromatic plants being exported from China annually, which translates to roughly about 5 billion US dollars. And China is covering almost 16% of the global trade. Now, trade in wild plants presents challenges. Um, it's challenges because demand is increasing. Uh, we don't just see people wanting more plants for the traditional industries, but we also see a lot of uh, new uh, industry sectors coming up. So nutritional supplement sectors or organic cosmetics, nutraceuticals. There are so many different industries that, that are coming up but which are using these ingredients. Trade chains are very complex, and very rarely there is a direct connection between companies buying and manufacturing the products and producers on the ground. This industry relies on the millions of wild harvesters in the poor and marginalized regions. And it's not a gross overstatement to say that probably people wild collecting plants are some of the poorest people you would ever meet. Um, because one of the reasons they're often collecting is because they don't have access to their own land where they could um, grow the crops. Wild harvesting and international trade is primarily informal and underreported. Legality is very complex. Um, so there is a legal trade in plants, um, but also often it includes issues, complicated issues around the access, tenure, use, and benefit sharing about plants. But also illegal trade creates risk for business. This is the headlines from something that came in just last week um, and surprised me, but, um, and I'm not even sure if it surprised me in a positive or negative way, but um, this, this article speaks about um, the essential oils company in the US that's been sentenced um, to pay $760,000 for violation of Lacey Act and Endangered Species Act um, in the US. And it's a really interesting example because we haven't seen this before. We haven't seen before companies in this sector being sort of, um, you know, being sort of either openly involved in illegal trade or prosecuted for this. But now, the good news, and I think it's different from presentations about rhino horn train or, or, or ivory, is trade in wild plants presents opportunities as well. Um, the sustainability market awareness is growing very rapidly. Uh, we see more and more companies responding to, the, um, you know, to this understanding of pressing need to demonstrate sustainability. There are tools and approaches that could demonstrate sustainable harvesting and equitable trade, and they are in use. The trade in wild plants that are non-timber create potential relevance to private uh, owners or forest owners. Um, because of course, timber trade um, has a limited benefit, so that's an additional opportunity. Um, trade in wild plants also um, could provide a landscape level conservation opportunity. And I'm going to give an example of this in a couple of slides. There are also different entry points from the policy perspective and legislative perspective that would allow us to work on sustainable trade in plants. Um, something that's been that's developed um, majorly in the past few years is uh, Nagoya Protocol and access and benefit sharing discussions, and they often concern the species that we're talking about because of the uses they have and traditional knowledge access. But also there are other policies around CBD and CITES, uh, Global Strategy for Plant Conservation, and others. 
So to this end, to, to provide a contribution to this discussion, uh, we've been working for many years uh, with a number of partners on something we call the Fair Wild Standard, um, which is a set of principles and criteria to verify sustainable and fair sourcing um, of plants from the wild. Now, Fair Wild um, is, is a set of principles, it's, it's, and it's based on an, a set of different actions that are uh, that the company or an organization is meant to demonstrate. Um, it includes things like resource assessment, the species and area management plan. Um, um, a company or organization would need to demonstrate the sustainable collection practices, um, something that's really complicated to implement and something we don't hear very much conversation in the wildlife trade sort of debate is, is around traceability of costs and finances around the trade and how to actually demonstrate the trade is fair um, and that the, there is a fair distribution of benefits along the, the trade chain. Um, so this cost calculation along the supply chain is a, is a really tricky part of fair wild standard, but that's what part of what make it work. Um, there is a requirement about the documented fair trading practices as well, and it's applicable anywhere in the world. So it doesn't only need to be in global south, um, as a number of other fair trade standards, you could apply it anywhere. Fair wild standard could be applied in a number of different ways. Uh, it could be applied through certification schemes. You could actually have a product that's, uh, that has a label, but also we've seen it applied um, in corporate policies. So companies making corporate social responsibility decision about their sourcing practices, but also legal and policy framework or community resource management. The fair wild is implemented in a, actually in very best number of countries. Um, now there are two different countries, uh, two different colors on this slide. There is blue and green. Um, what the blue mean is a very straightforward business to business certification project where with very few exceptions is a business to business relationship. There isn't an NGO involvement in, in this trade. Um, the green color is, which are many more actually on this slide, are the projects are normally the Fairwild implementation projects that don't necessarily lead to certification, but where Fairwild is used as a resource management system. First Fairwild certified products entered the market in 2009, and um, this was a big, you know, a big need and a big opportunity for us because. Um, up to that point, a lot of conversation was, well, yes, we'd like to raise a consumer awareness about the issue, but where do we point the consumers to? So having these products on the market is clearly sort of important test for it. Um, and there are a few companies that are involved in trading this product now. Um, here's another example of a species for you. Um, it's a licorice root on the bottom. All three pictures are of, are of a licorice root. And I think you either hate it or love it. I've figured out over years people are in two different groups in the world. Um, but basically, of course, a uh, root that's um, threatened in China, um, most of it is wild collected for medicinal purposes, but a lot of it is cultivated for, cu for culinary purposes, um, used in cosmetics and spices, in traditional Chinese medicine, one of the key ingredients. Um, so a fascinating plant in itself. I'm going to give you two examples of um, sort of Let's, let's say from a producer level of the use of the fair wild standard and give you one example from a brand holding a company perspective. So in terms of the, um, this example is from India, from Northwestern Guts, um, um, a biodiversity hotspot, um, where the species in question is um, a beautiful tree, um, terminalia tree. Um, they're ingredient of a very important Ayurvedic formula. Um, however, the fruit itself is actually very cheap, so there isn't much value for, for people in fruit itself. Um, something that's really interesting about the tree that makes people very excited about it, it's a nesting site for two species of hornbills, which are beautiful and you know, wonderful to observe. Because the price of fruit is very, is very low, what happened and is very common with a lot of the resources trees was used they were used for logging primarily. Um, there was a project um, funded by the Darwin, UK government Darwin Initiative um, and facilitated by a local NGO um, that looked at the fair wild certification use and something important they've done from the very beginning is to bring in a company that inter was interested in buying this product. Um, and as part of this process, they've reached Fairwall certification and they kept it for three years now. Um, and as, as an outcome of this, um, 
600 large streets of Terminale Bellerica were saved, um, which is about 30 hornbill nesting sites and provided sustainable livelihood opportunities to over 100 collectors. This tree and hornbill conservation is what, is what the company that's marketing this product is primarily using, which is an interesting point about the landscape level conservation measures I was trying to talk about. I think this species presents a great opportunity to, to talk about the conservation of other species, including mammals, um, including those charismatic species that, that we all sort of are admiring. Example from a very different part of the world, um, Central Europe, Southeast Europe um, is one of the very important places around the world where wild plants are harvested for what you call European pharmacopoeia. So anything that probably, if you're, if you're from Europe or North America, um, a traditional medicine for, would mean using teas that include ingredients from this region. Now this project is from Bielowieża forest in Poland, which is um, a protected area and is a beautiful, beautiful place in itself. Um, there is about, in this company um, on the ground, there is about 500 registered collectors uh, that are involved, 90% of which are elderly and retired, and 10% are unemployed. This region and a lot of other regions around the world are facing a very different issue from, I think, what we see with the rest of wildlife trade is that it's the collectors who seem to be endangered in a lot of these places rather than the species uh, that they're collecting. So the tradition of, and cultural sort of uh, culture and tradition of wild harvesting itself is dying out in many places. Um, China has, uh, China in a lot of mountainous areas face very similar future where people are moving out um, to cities and stop collecting. And you think it means a good thing, but occasionally it actually means an opposite for the species conservation themselves. This company was Fair Wild certified since 2009, so it was one of those first companies um, that um, with the products of which were used in that final, final product. Um, and Fair Wild certification enabled closer relationship with collectors because of course, who you're certifying in Fair Wild is the company that's organizing the collection and labor organization in wild harvesting is very different from farming. You often deal with collectors that are dispersed in many villages in many areas. 60 collector families receive a premium prize for what they collect, dandelion roots and nettle leaves, and benefit from the Fairwild Premium Fund. So Fairwild requires a buyer paying premium fund to community development project in addition to, to uh, Fairwild price. So for example, in 2012, uh, their sales generated over $7,000 of community fund, which is not, you know, is outside of what's actually paid for them as a, as, as a cost of products, um, and it has increased since. And there is a strength in management and monitoring system. Now, you, could, you, you probably did pick on the dandelion roots and nettle leaves issue and think, God, why are we talking about that? Um, how is that important? Well, it's a fascinating issue as well, because in this case, the use of these lower risk species really leads to wider landscape level conservation. Because what you're required to do on the fair wild system is to create species and management plan, even for species like dandelion and nettle and declaring it other species that are more endangered, more threatened in the area. So actually leading to better, better conservation practices for the area. Now from the brand holder perspective, and I've um, taken this company that's been engaged with Fairwild from the very beginning called Traditional Medicinals. They're the largest North American producer of the herbal products, um, herbal medicinal products. Um, they've been involved with Fairwild since early 2000s. About 35% of their botanical ingredients by volume of, are wild collected. Um, they have seven producers in six countries that implemented fair wild standard. And what, I'm, what, what is written here is actually the words of a company, so it's not my analysis of them, but how they, they assess what the certification meant to them. Um, so they speak about the risk assessment, resource management, sustainable resource management plans developed for all the collection areas um, under fair wild system. Fair wild certification requires an annual third party audit, um, which is a cost, but is, um, is providing the best data you could imagine about the, uh, for monitoring and adaptive management. And individual collectors are voting on how to best use the Fairwild Premium Fund. In 2016, so the last year that we have this data from, um, traditional medicinals purchased over 113 tons of Fairwild certified ingredients and marketed 10 um, 
Fair World label terrible tea products. Something that's really interesting about this company and a few other companies that we work with, um, which is fairly rare in this industry, um, they have an annual sustainability and benefit report that clearly um, analyzes and addresses the issue of how much of the, their ingredients are coming from the wild and how much of them are covered by Fair World certification scheme. And they do it year on year. They demonstrate the change. And it's something we'd like to see more and more you know, happening in other, in other, with other companies. So Fair World progress to date, what is the difference that it makes? Um, so there is about 300 tons of Fair World medicinal plants that are certified, traded annually, um, which is a fascinating thing to think about because um, a few years back we were at zero. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great number of, um, of ingredients. There is over 20 companies involved, 17 species of Fair Wild certified, and over 50 products are on the market. So you can actually go to the shop and buy uh, Fair Wild certified products. We even got the gin, so we're all covered. Um, in a different project that's not related to Fair Wild certification, but the use of the standard, uh, we worked with key traditional Chinese medicine manufacturers and traders in China to use fair wild principles as the basis of, of their corporate social responsibility on, on trading in wild plants, which was a fascinating experience, and I can talk to any of you about this um, separately. We've been looking to use fair wild in national strategies. Um, so, for example, Mexico National Plant Conservation Strategy is recognizing fair wild as a good vehicle and a good tool to, for best practices on, on wild harvesting and trade and recommend its use. Um, it's been used in the formal legislation. So South Africa, for example, has gone the route of biodiversity management plan development uh, for a number of species. One of the first um, species that they've used has been, uh, was Pelargonium sedoides, uh, which is a medicinal plant. Um, and also it's contributing to a number of international commitments. Because the session is, is looking uh, specifically at the changing demand, um, I wanted to to reflect slight, very quickly on this. Um, so we've recognized that uh, the work we do with Fairwild is, you know, is, is good, it's good to have a solid tool. We've invested heavily with Fairwild Foundation in actually making the tool work, the certification system work, but we see very slow uptake by the companies. Um, so something that, that we thought would be a really important thing to add is, is talking to consumers and public through the companies that are involved in this trade. So uh, first time this year, um, about a month ago, we've run this Fair Wild Week, which was actually managed by Paca Herbs, which is a herbal trade company here in the UK. Um, and they've run this, um, this beautiful campaign, which was really to educate people about number of, sheer number of wild plants used in everyday products. Now to, to end with this presentation, um, well, we're next to um, equitable and sustainable trade in wild plant ingredients. Um, so one thing, um, we need further support to the development of effective policies and laws that facilitate and incentivize responsible trade practices. And I think it's generally something that I'd like to see more in the conversations about better legislation. The issue of incentives and, and incentives for who, I think, is important to resolve. Um, um, there should be better facilitation of producers' capacity building and market access, because, of course, we speak about people who need to get this information in the a, in a, in a best way possible. Um, and further enhancement of industry and market transformation approaches, um, both by making more companies use tools like Fairwild, but also having more, um, you know, having, having a more innovative trade flagship approaches maybe, um, where we could engage key companies to change their practices towards um, sustainability of wild sourcing. And finally, we probably need to carry on with continued consumer awareness raising and, and, and education. And on this, I'll say thank you. Thank you.